everybody, this is Grace Potter, and you are on BackstageAccess.com, where the real show begins. Gus Gustinger here with Backstage Access in beautiful Canandaigua, New York, with the lovely and talented Grace Potter. Hey. <laughs> How you doing? I'm good. How are you? Good. Uh, two weeks is going to be a big day for you. Midnight's going to be released, your new record. Yep. Uh, Hollywood Records, August 14th, mm -hmm. actually on a Friday now, not on a Tuesday. All the record know, releases are on a Friday. A is that confusing day. you at all? Or no? no, because every night is Friday night for me. So. <laughs> Good answer, right? <laughs> Uh, tell us about, uh, you've given uh, the fans, uh, we saw you on Tuesday in our park, we were just talking about it, uh, over the last couple months you've been playing a lot of new tracks, Alive Tonight, Empty Heart, Biggest Fan, Delirious, giving a, the fans a little taste. Uh, yeah. Tell us about uh, writing the new record and how different was it from writing with the Nocturnals? Well, I've always written all the music for the Nocturnals, mm -hmm. um, and when I write a song, what I usually do is I build the bones, you know, sort of right. the scaffolding, and then the band would come and kind of flesh it out. Uh, and I always say, like, I would I would make the skeleton and they make it into, like, a big <laughs> voluptuous woman. Um, and really the, the big difference with this process this time was that I was fleshing the songs out myself as well. I was kind of taking on a little bit more of a role of producer, even with the demos, and filling in sounds. And a lot of it was keyboard driven, because I primarily play the keyboards. That's how I, I learned music. Right. So I think when I bring a song to the band, I'm looking for additional things. And in this case, with a lot of the music, it, these were completed thoughts. Um, and having said that, I mean, the Nocturnals played on the record and they killed it. I mean, they were just such a, uh, they're always a huge part of me. They're an extension of me. And, right. you know, even when I'm going solo they're they're still there and ever present as you can see from the live show yes they're still, right they're still we here. saw it on tuesday yeah. yes they're still there just not a name but right, it, right. and what's in, in a spirit name? and body exactly right. i always say a rose by any other name still rocks as hard and you were just talking about uh being like uh creating a song kind of with the keyboards and you're a multi-instrumentalist yep. so when you create a song is it a specific instrument that you kind of like lean towards grabbing or is it kind of organic or? That, that's a good question. Uh, and it, it's, it was different with this record as well because I started with drums. Okay, well and that's I love, different. Because okay. I love drumming. Right. Uh, and obviously I've, I've got an incredible well of drummers at my disposal. Everybody in the band gets around the drum kit at one point <laughs> and plays. Uh, but I also love to drum and I really, I ha I'm very drawn to drum patterns. So for this record, I, I, I was trying to figure out how the songs could depart a bit from what I do while also right. maintaining the the core message that I you know that's coming from my heart and so by starting with the beat of a drum uh, you know you really do go in some new melodic directions and it guided me in all kinds of new places and new terrain that I just I, I loved it was surprising it was sort of unexpected and um, it came in waves you know because initially I didn't think this was going to be a solo record right and I think I can't speak for my bandmates, but I think they kind of knew before I did. But listen to these know? songs, actually. Uh, it seems more of these songs are more intimate, more personal. I don't know if that's actually the case yeah, here. Very okay. Yeah, that's like everybody, the word is revealing, and it, it's true. I'm, okay. I didn't mask my, I didn't mask anything. I wasn't trying to hide behind metaphor. I wasn't really telling other people's stories, maybe with one or two exceptions where I, I really felt that, my suffering wasn't as powerful as potentially talking about a more universal message of, right. you know somebody who lives out on the street or um, you know somebody who's struggling f you know to, to find a meal like I, I don't know that experience right. and so sometimes you do have to play characters but for the most part with this record I wasn't in character I was I was me speaking from the heart you know and you uh, the the records produced by Eric Valentine who and I had it right because the list is pretty long and I'll name a couple bands Queens of the Stone Age slash Nickelback to be a few. Yeah. Um, tell us about the experience work with Eric and what did he get out of you that maybe another producer hasn't been able to channel, so to speak? 
I mean, he's a real producer. Right. You know? And I think that's a big part of what I've always been drawn to in making records is someone who doesn't really produce. Okay. And they're kind of hands off because right. I, I'm so determined to do things my way. Okay. And I really, you know, from the age of four or five, <laughs> I, I, I do not like being told what to do. Okay. And I think the connection that we made was that we trusted each other implicitly from like the day we met. It was right. like, if he had an idea, he didn't feel weird presenting it to me and also the second i met him i was like i'm gonna here's all my demos which i'm, I'm really cagey about sharing my okay. music especially if it's not ready yet mm -hmm. so it was already a, a good dialogue and a, and a trust there Rapport, yeah. and also i just think you know you hear the records he's produced and you can see the the sonic arc of what he's capable of I felt like I was in good hands and that I knew that, you know, if we were going to take it down a weird path, which we certainly did on this one, it was really unexpected and sort of wandered into pop a little bit, a lot of rock and roll, but definitely some new elements were being introduced. He, he probably didn't know what he was getting into <laughs> when mm. he started. <laughs> he thought he was going to be making like a hard rock record. Okay. And then, you know, Midnight came out. <laughs> 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 then he said, whoa, I yeah. think he's going to be very happy, obviously, with the yeah. results when everybody hears and gives him the positive feedback. That is, obviously, sure. he knows the record already. But um, what do you think fans can expect when they pick up the record? Um, like you were just talking about all these different types of vibes, but if you, and I hate to say pigeonhole it, because I saw a couple interviews and you were talking about boogie rock. Boogie. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, it's funny, Benny called it solar boogie, okay, which I thought was great. I think it's cosmic bo boogie, you know, it's very, <laughs> very outer space. There's okay. definitely a lot of Bowie. I mean, my influences, I wear them on my sleeve mm -hmm. sometimes, and sometimes I tuck them away a little bit more. Um, this is a pop record. I mean, if we can talk about pop music without that being a bad word, because it's really not, you know, I mean, I'm sorry, but fucking Led Zeppelin was a pop yeah. band, you know, at the time. Excuse me, I can't probably say the F word. Oh, you can say whatever you want. Okay, we are backstage. <laughs> this is what backstage is about. Yeah. But I mean, you know, The Who was pop music. Pink right. Floyd was pop music. There's a lot of music that I loved that I grew up with that was considered pop. And then somewhere along the line there, pop sort of diluted itself into what sounds like it's processed and made formulaically for radio. Mm -hmm. um, and so in a way, by joining that conversation, I have... I have intentionally engaged in in the pop music conversation with this record in a way that I've only tiptoed around in the past. Okay. You know. But so wait till August 14th when everybody gets their little hands on a new record, Midnight. Yeah. And tell us about the design for the record, the cover. I think it's yeah. kind of cool. It's a little cosmic, like you were saying, a little for sure. spacey and yeah, there, a lot of and cool there's colors. Like elements of, d like, I wanted it to sort of look like uh, something Elvis might have put out, except I'm definitely not Elvis. But, you know, like <laughs> the font. I, I, I just was told by my management, they're like, you know, Grace, most artists go through... 16 to 20 composites of different options of mm. images before they settle on a record right. cover. I went through 137. Wow. <laughs> Jesus. And it's a cool story because we mm. went renegade for the record cover. Um, the photo I, it was not taken with like a record label, let's go in and you know do a big photo shoot. It was actually just taken in, in about 70 snapshots backstage okay. with a girl who was shooting for a different band. And right. I would just happened to be there that day. And I knew her, I really loved her work. And I was like, can you just like snap a few photos and let's see what happens. And in about 10 minutes, we took the record cover Doesn't photo. it how it usually happens? Something unexpectedly, and next thing you know, yep. It just happened like yep. that. I had no shirt on also in that photo. There's a, I'm <laughs> definitely topless on the cover of my record. <laughs> For all those guys out there, a little tidbit, a little right. uh, backstage information because right. we're backstage. Uh, you are the first. That is an exclusive <laughs> for backstage. Yes, nice. <laughs> Uh, tell us about the magical midnight piano. What's going on? Yes. With that. So I, I I'm very new to the like hashtag and yeah. social media world. I don't know. I mean, I come from the generation just before the internet mm -hmm. really took off. So I feel like I'm tr again trying to and actively engaging in the process of a global conversation. Right. Midnight piano. The magical midnight piano is something that we painted and made into part of the sort of mascot of the tour. And this album, if you listen to it and you really listen to what I'm saying, I'm trying to engage in a conversation between the fans. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think songs are, are a conversation. They're a dialogue between the listener and the people making the music. 
So I wanted the piano to be the conduit between me okay. and my fans. And I think that by inviting fans to play this instrument, that we roll out every single venue we play in, every lobby or you know media area, tent area, there's sort of like a place where you can buy beer, T-shirts, whatever it is. We find an opportune spot for the Sit piano. Sit and play your favorite Billy Joel song. That's right. <laughs> or anything else you want. I, I actually heard some Queen yesterday, okay, which nice. maybe I was enjoying. Mm. I, I could, I, And I usually set it up somewhere where I can hear it. So I can hear what right. the fans are playing. And I'm I'm able to, like, through the looking glass, kind of yep. enjoy them giving me a concert right beforehand. Awesome. Yeah. So it's great. And then people can take photos of themselves or videos of them showing their sweet, sweet hot licks. And they can post it. And then sometimes if I like what they've done, I... Awesome. I, I hit retweet right. or repost or, I don't know, social media stuff. And you're still a native of Vermont, correct? I am. Yep. Okay, I'm so native of Vermont. Uh, I don't know, is it a Vermontian? How do you, what do you guys call yourselves? Vermonters. Vermonters. Or okay. Vermonsters. All right. Mm -hmm. The uh, Vermonter, Grace Potter, tell us what you do when you're not on the road doing music or whatnot. Maybe somebody out there, obviously, like, does she like to cook or does she have some, like, does she ski? Or? I do both of those things Okay. ad nauseum. I mean, I, <laughs> I, I cook way too much food. Okay. And eat it. You couldn't tell, obviously. Uh, I, I do. I, I have a, high, a nice high metabolism, which mm. works in my favor. I want to learn how to surf. That's my new thing. I definitely want to learn how to surf and scuba dive. Um, I've always been afraid of the water, which is interesting because I have an album called Nothing But The Water. I'm really <laughs> creeped out because I grew up ar around Lake Champlain where people used to use their car motors and like weird, weird stuff to moor their boats, like really weird, creepy, rusty things underwater. And I cut my foot when I was six years old on somebody's mooring underwater and it's kind of murky and creepy. So I've always been really yeah. afraid of what's underwater. So I'd like to learn how to, to the creature from the blue lagoon. Yeah. <laughs> I want to not be freaked out by the water anymore. Um, but I like to build things. I, I used to be a contractor, so I, oh, okay. I like to I like to do house projects and just fix things. You know? Oh, that's cool. Yeah. Handyman. Handyman GP over there, here. There you go. A uh, big thing happened in uh, your, uh, I, I should say, musical career just a couple months ago. Yeah. You got to, you know what I'm going to talk about. You got to perform with Mick Jagger and the Rolling Stones. How effing cool is that? It was. <laughs> it was the most incredible experience and uh, one that not that many people get to right. click that one off their bucket list. So I, I was just, uh, re a, I guess milestone is an understatement, but yeah. it was a really big deal. It was a very, very big moment in my career and, and one that I will not soon forget. Yeah, because uh, they actually play where I live in Buffalo, New York. and they actually On the 11th, right? Yep, they yeah. closed the U.S. portion of the tour in Buffalo, and uh, the Broken Bones opened up, but they didn't come out and perform with the Rolling Stones, so you Not everybody got a gets lucky. to do yeah, that. You I got know. lucky. I can't believe it happened. It was funny because when it happened, it was, um, it was my husband's birthday, okay. my drummer in my band. It was right. his birthday. And th so there were all kinds of phone calls and little surprises and things I was trying to plan around for his birthday. And so I was so in my head trying to think of right. cool things to do for him that I, when I got the phone call, Dave Stewart from the Eurythmics actually was the one who called okay. and said, Mick's trying to get a hold of you. He wants to know what song you want to do. And, and I'm like, like what? Am I married? What? 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 <laughs> what? I, like, I was busy. I, we went to a Star yeah. Trek exhibit. We were at, at the Mall of America in right. Minneapolis and I was at a Star Trek exhibit thinking about birthdays and yeah. you know just like writing the set list and it was also our debut with the new band so the, the no one had seen the new band before so right. there's a lot of other things on my mind was that the first show of the tour it was the first show of the tour okay it was the first time that the uh the new lineup okay and my solo band everything came to uh, uh, a crescent uh, right exactly. there exactly <laughs> and it was raining during my it was so romantic <laughs> and uh, awesome and you know Mick Mick was such a gentleman and all the guys in the band are just amazing and I really I loved it like I went to sound check with them you know and Ronnie Wood is like chain smoking cigarettes and Keith's got a cocktail and like they're all just they yeah. you're in That's their the movie Stones. you're in their movie and they really yeah. are that way yeah. you know Really cool. Awesome. Congratulations, Thank obviously. You. And we should say pre credit congratulations for the the new record because all the songs we heard, like I said, are, are very cool and they're all Thank unique you. in their own little way. Yeah. Um, so definitely pick it, pick it up. Hollywood Records, like I said, in a couple of weeks. Anything you want to tell the fans out there what to expect uh, besides playing and uh you know just, obviously the new record yeah i mean the new record is is always exci it's exciting because it's different but i think that one thing i really do want fans to know is that i'm you know i'm somebody who 
changes a lot. I like to explore and try new things, but at the end of the day, you're, you're still getting me. So if you do think uh, you might want to come out to a live show, um, that's, that's where the true experience happens. So I, I always encourage people to buy the record. I'm, I'm so proud of this record. Uh, but even if this record isn't necessarily your jam, uh, or if it's your favorite thing you've ever heard from us, the live show is a seamless concoction, an evil rock and roll cocktail of everything that you've ever known about us and a few things you don't know. If you haven't seen her perform live, it's a must do. We, like we said, we just <laughs> saw her on Tuesday and it's, it's a new experience. She, uh, you grab a hold of a crowd like very few do. Well, thank you. So we're going to wrap this interview up because she's going to be taking the stage here at CMAC. Backstageaccess.com. Pick up the new record, and thanks for taking the time. Midnight. Woo! <laughs>